another song. Let's go ahead and start, get started. I want to welcome everybody here. Glad you can make it. If you're a visitor, uh, we're glad that you're here. We'd like you to fill out the visitor's card. It's right in front of you there and just give it to someone, leave it on the pew. Uh, it'll make its way to the proper place. Anyone need a communion cup? We need a couple here. Jackie needs one. <laughs> well, he, he didn't see your hand. Okay. Please, uh, people to keep in your prayers. Sam Rubel is still in Southwest Medical Center, but he's been transferred to a regular room. He was in an irregular room, and now he's in a regular room. But he's getting better. Uh, Sue Fleming, Carol Yandel, Doris Webb, who's Marilyn Johnson's mother, Ada McDaniel, Kathy Reynolds, and Ray McCuller, who is at home now. Uh, and Christopher asks that we uh, keep him in our prayers. He's having a treadmill test on f April 11th. And uh, Dwayne gave me this note. Carla Holmes, who's here today, will be having surgery on Friday. So we want to encourage her and keep her in our prayers. And uh, Dixie sent me a, Dixie Cooper sent me a text earlier this week. She said, just share this with the elders. So I, I don't even think I did that, actually. But Paul showed up today, and I, I mentioned, he, he started telling me, that she was still having trouble. And I said, you know, she told me not to s tell anybody but the elders. But he said it was okay to tell you. So if I get in trouble, it's his fault. But Dixie, when she went to vote and during the primary, she, she passed out and collapsed there. And uh, it took a while before she could get the necessary tests run. She had an MRI and an MRA. If you want to know what an MRA is, talk to Trey. And uh, that was on Friday, and she'll get the results hopefully on Monday. So remember Dixie. Okay. Uh, remember, today is our fifth Sunday dinner, and there will be no evening service. Men's breakfast this Saturday at 8 a.m. Uh, it's always a good time, so let's try to make an effort to be there. Uh, several of our young people will be involved in leadership training for Christ uh, this coming Friday and Saturday. Uh, still, if you want to donate to the fire relief, we can do that. Uh, we've sent out checks, uh, $9,400 worth, uh, three churches, the Borger Church of Christ, the Canadian Church of Christ, and the Gage, no, no, Shattuck Gage Church of Christ. And we've already got a uh, thank you note back from the uh, Church of Christ in Borger. I'll put it on the board. And we also received a thank you note from uh, uh, Carol Pensano from the Agape Church of Christ. They're the sponsoring church for uh, Sal Car Cariaga, who's going to be here in a month or two. He's the gentleman that we sent some money to, has, his, has the work in the Philippines. I'll put both of those cards on the board. Uh, heads up on adult classes starting in May. We're, we're shooting for three different classes. The young adults, uh, they want to go upstairs. So uh, I, I don't know. I guess they just want to get away from the rest of us. But they're going to be up there, and we'll have two classes over here. If you have any suggestions, ideas, topics you want to uh, cover, let, uh, let me know. Let, let any of the elders know. Uh, Linda Bell has generously donated to the church a whole lot of artificial creamers and a whole lot of coffee. Uh, it's, it's, in the, it's in the kitchen. Feel free. Uh, she says if we need more, she can provide it, but I would almost take that a challenge. <laughs> I don't know if 
10 congregations could go through that much artificial creamer in a year. So anyhow, uh, take a look at that. And one last thing, uh, Larry uh, had this in the table on the back there. It's, it's the uh, Latin American Missions newsletter. We sent some money, uh, Jane and Larry go, I guess, every, I don't know, regularly down to Latin America through this service. We sent some money. Uh, I went through it here a little bit, just, uh, well, anyway, I'll have it back there. It's pretty interesting. So that's all I have. Their opening prayer is Micaiah. Closing prayer is Kevin. Joe is the song. Would you bow with me? Father God, we thank you for this day that you have given us to come together as a family and to worship you. We thank you for this day that, you, that you've given us. We thank you for the weather and the beauty there is. We thank you for spring and the beauty that there is. If you would please stand with me for the first two songs we'll sing this morning. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love. For Jesus, who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Be seated, please. Next song will be number 984. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time. And Lord of all, Lord, you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down 
and we worship you, Lord, we bow down, and we worship you, Lord, Lord of all, Lord, you will be, you are King of creation and King of my life, King of the land and the sea. You were king of the heavens before there was time, and king of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king king of all kings you will be to help us prepare our minds for the lord's supper this morning we'll sing number 511 511 all three verses Oft we come together, oft we sing and pray, here we bring our offering on this holy from those you love can be difficult. It can be intimidating. It can be scary. It can lead to um, you being depressed. To be separate from those you love can be one of the hardest challenges to face in your life. As Christians, we never have to worry about being away from God, about being separated from God. We're here to take this Lord's Supper, and it's a reminder of what he's done for us, of the blessings in that, and also the fact that because Christ died for us, we never have to worry 
about being away from God, of having to have a divide between us, though we know what that's like. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul wrote, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. We all know what it's like to be dead in sin, to be away from God, but because he loved us, he sent Jesus, and Jesus died so that you and I could be alive. As we take the Lord's Supper, let's reflect on that, that idea of, of never having to worry about being away from God again because of the death of Christ. Let's pray for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we come before you, and we're so humble, Lord. We're, we're so in awe of your greatness, of your power, of your majesty, Lord. We know how mighty and great you are, and yet you take the time to listen to us. You take the time to accept our worship and our admiration and our pray for the cup. Our Father in heaven, you are so wonderful, Lord. We love you so much. We praise and honor you. Lord, we thank you for inviting us to your table, for allowing us to sit with you, for allowing us to reflect on your son. We thank you for all the blessings that come through him, that come through his blood. Lord, we thank you for um, the purification. We thank you for the life that comes through him. Dear Lord, we thank you that we never have to worry about being separate from you because of Jesus and because of what he did. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. For those of you following along in the songbooks this morning, you might mark number 389. Then the song before the lesson this morning will be number one. If you would please stand with me for this song. Each day I'll do a golden deed by helping those who are in My life on earth is but a span, and so I'll do the best I can. Life's evening sun, life's evening sun is sinking low. A few more days, and I must go to meet the deed. That I have done, where there will be no setting sun. I'll help someone in time of need and journey on with rapid speed. I'll help the sick and poor and Words of kindness to them speak. Life's evening sun, life's evening sun is sinking low. A few more days, and I must go to meet the deeds that I have done. Where there will be. Setting sun while going down life's weary road. I'll try to lift some traveler's load. I'll try to turn the night to day, make flowers bloom along the Life's 
evening sun is sinking low. A few more days, and I must go to meet the deeds that I have done. Where there will be no setting sun. Be seated, please. Good morning, church. I would wish you Merry Christmas, but you probably wouldn't understand that uh, mention because for me, this time of year, that's my Christmas, March Madness. This is my time. Uh, this is my favorite, one of my favorite times of the year. And so, uh, Merry Christmas to those of you who observe. Uh, it's it's a good time of the year. Hope you've had a good weekend. We're going to finish up this series that we started a couple of weeks ago. Did want to tack on one other quick announcement. Uh, as you know, we're having the potluck today. We hope you can stick around and stay for that and enjoy uh, the food and the fellowship. Uh, we are planning next week, weather permitting, to have an egg hunt for the kids out here. And we hope that you will not only bring your own kids, but you will invite others uh, to come and worship with us and then stay for that. And so to prepare for that, we're going to be stuffing some eggs, filling some eggs with some candy. Uh, after the potluck, we don't have evening service tonight, and so uh, if you can and you're willing, you want to stick around and help us with that, we'd appreciate the help. How many of you have been on a mission trip before? Okay, a few of you. How many of you have gone to church camp before? Oh, a lot more. Okay. So I was thinking about this. I, I've been, I grew up going to different church camps, mainly one church camp when I was younger. And then as I got older, I've worked as staff at several different camps. And I've gone to different church camps over the years. And I've also been fortunate to go on several mission trips. I remember in school, uh, we would have a, a choice. And it was during this time, usually spring break time. When I was at OSU, they'd say, well, we typically do a trip to uh, the Houston area, the inner city in Houston. There's a congregation that's down there that does a lot of really good stuff, and that's one option. You can go down there for spring break and serve, or we take another group, and we go to Mexico, and we help build uh, a church building. And so if you're the manual labor type, physical, you know, that's your thing. You don't really want to do a whole lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction. Maybe you're introverted. You go, well, okay, I'm going to go to Mexico. Or you say, man, I really want to go to a place where I can actually converse with other people who speak English. And, you know, you, I can go to Houston and I can talk to the people there and, and that'll be fun. And, and so you had these, this choice of going to all, on these trips. And what I found is when we go to these types of places, we have what we call these spiritual highs. And I remember I would go to, to church camp and you would have that, you'd be in that setting. And if you've gone to church camp, you know what I'm talking about where sometimes you would, you would go to a church camp or a mission trip and you would have this spiritual high. And so I was thinking about, well, maybe sometimes you're doing trips where you're doing manual labor. Sometimes you're building a church building. You're going on these trips and you're interacting with other people in the community. And there's just something about getting away from home, getting away from yourself and going out and serving other people and it just really makes things, I don't know, it just puts things in a new perspective. And what happens usually is we get what we call this high. And so this is, happens a lot on mission trips. It also happens at church camps. I remember growing up in church camps, you would have this uh, setting where you have all these people together. You're, you're away from all the stuff in the world. And, of course, now it's even more helpful to get away from technology. Back when I was growing up, we didn't have all these things to get away from as much. Uh, but it was good to just get out there in nature and you'd just be out there singing and you'd be studying and, and, and all day, you know, Bible classes and fellowship. And that was just a really good thing. And you'd, sometimes you'd have that moment where you would sit around a campfire and you'd be singing songs to God. And you just, you just feel this feeling of, man, I'm just, I, I could just run through a wall right now. Anybody ever experienced that? And so we have these spiritual highs and what happens is, I've seen this a lot, and maybe you've seen it in your circumstances and your experiences as well. We get really amped up, and we go, man, I just can't wait to do this. I can't wait to do that. Specifically, we'd go on these mission trips, and we would start talking, you know, well, when we get back home, here's what we're going to do. 
I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and we're going to start this ministry over here and we're going to do this and you're just on fire for God and the ideas are just flowing and you just got all this good stuff and we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then you'd get home and you'd get settled and you'd maybe go through and wash all that laundry from that trip that you were just on and things are starting to, that schedule's getting back to normal. And then you'd find over time... I didn't really follow through on any of those things that I was so passionate about just a week or two before. And this happens. Sometimes we can't duplicate that. I don't know that we should. Sometimes we just have those special moments in our life where we take a mission trip or we go to a church camp. Maybe it's for you. It's just having good fellowship with your church family. Maybe that can do it for you. Where we have this, this motivation, this high, but then sometimes it just kind of fizzles out. There's a lot of talk that goes on in these settings, and we don't always really follow through. So I want to start with a passage uh, this morning. Last couple weeks ago, we talked about, you know, we're talking about talk is cheap and saying the right things and doing the right things. We looked at language and speech the last time. Today, we're going to kind of try to put these two together and talk about uh, the doing aspect of this. And so we're going to go to James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. And we'll read through this passage, the well-known passage. I'm sure you've heard it before. But I want to revisit this and look at what James says about this idea. James 2, starting in verse 14. He says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Now someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Well, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by their faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? And as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Here's what I want us to think about this morning. And we'll kind of come back to this a couple of times. I want us to think about this idea that conviction, unless it's converted into conduct, it doesn't mean anything. Conviction is useless if we don't take that and convert it into conduct. You can have as many spiritual highs as you want. You can get really fired up. You can talk a good game. You can have all the church answers. You can have the knowledge. You can have that emotion just going through you. But if you don't do anything about it, if that rubber never meets the road... James says it's dead. It's pointless. Knowledge is good. I don't want us to discredit that. I don't think that there's anything wrong. Obviously, it's a good thing for us to be knowledgeable of God's word. It's good for us to, to know these things, to know what Jesus has done for us. We can talk about these facts, these historical facts, and we can go through the scriptures, and we can talk about how Jesus went to the cross. We can talk about his death and his burial and his resurrection and what that means for us. We can know book, chapter, and verse. All those things are good. But if we just have a bunch of head knowledge and we're not doing anything with it, James is saying, well, what's the point? So conviction, unless it's converted into conduct, it becomes useless for us. Now, he says earlier in this, a couple, just a chapter before this, he's talking about something very similar. And in James chapter 1, he's talking about the Word of God, and he connects it to this idea of doing also. He says, do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like someone 
who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But then he says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And so we have this disconnect where sometimes we have a lot of emotion, we're very, we have these spiritual highs and we want to do a lot of things, but sometimes it just fizzles out. And then other times we just have a lot of knowledge. We know a lot of things. Maybe you grew up in the church, you know all this stuff backwards and forwards. You know, you know these passages that we've read this morning. You, can, you were in Bible class and you, you, you've absorbed all of this, you've learned all of this, and those are all good things. But if we don't take what we know and if we don't take that emotion and turn it into actionable results, What's the point? It's just a bunch of stuff that we have in our heads, just a bunch of knowledge, just a bunch of, you know, feelings that went wasted. So it seems to me what we have is we have this emotion that we have in our lives, and we're trying to to figure out how do we take that and how do we move that into something that we can actually do? Because a lot of times we have that emotion and then it just goes away. We get back home, those Weeks or two weeks, three weeks, whatever pass, and all those wonderful plans that we schemed up with our friends. Oh, we're going to get home, and we're going to do this, and we're going to we're going to reach out to the homeless, and we're going to start this ministry, and we're going to, and then it just goes away. So it seems to me the disconnect is between this emotion, or maybe you might even say the knowledge that we have, and the action. And I would say that gap in between the two, between emotion or knowledge. And action, that's where a lot of our good intentions go to die. This is, that gap right there is a huge gap. Because we all can look back in, our, in moments in our life. Maybe you've experienced, experienced one recently. Maybe you're looking forward to experiencing one this summer. You're going to go to church camp or help out with the church camp. Maybe you've been on a mission trip before. You're planning to. This is where a lot of these things go to die. We have all these plans, but we can't quite figure out how do I take this feeling that I have of wanting to do a lot of stuff for God's kingdom, how do I turn that into actual results? And so we have to move, and this is a difficult process, but we have to figure out how do we move from emotion or knowledge to actually doing something? I I think it's interesting, the verse that he mentions there in verse 19 of James chapter 2, he says, You know, you believe that God exists. You believe that there is one God. And he says, that's good. But don't pat yourself on the back too much. Even demons believe that. And I don't know that we would ever go around to someone. And uh, this is probably not a good icebreaker to to, to tell people, you know, I've noticed that you have faith. That's good. You know, demons have faith. So essentially you have the faith of a demon. Uh, That's probably not going to go over very well. Um, But that's what he's saying. Don't, who cares? You have faith. Anybody who's exposed to the truth, even the demons, they know the truth. They know that God exists. They know that God is real. They know he is the one true God. And you know that too, so you don't really know any more than them. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? And so we have to move beyond this, that conviction, it's useless unless we turn it into something good. Emotion is good. As I mentioned, knowledge is good. Emotion is also good. But if it doesn't lead to action, it's pointless. Here's a passage in in Titus where Paul is speaking to Titus. He's writing to Titus. He's talking about different rebellious people that that he is being exposed to and kind of giving him some warnings and some instructions on how to deal with this. He gives a description about these rebellious people that I think is interesting. In Titus chapter 1, verse 16, he says, These people, they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. They're detestable, disobedient. And unfit for doing anything good. That's a, that's a really haunting phrase if you really stop and examine your life. It says, they claim to know God, but the way that they live proves otherwise. Their actions deny him. Let's think about this. Ask yourself this question. Do your actions, does the way that you live... Does it point to God or does it deny him? When other people look at you, do, do you, do they deny, does your actions deny to others that you belong 
to God? Or can they look at you and can they, as that old phrase goes, they walk the walk, they talk the talk, they match it up, right? They're doing what they need to do. The rubber's hitting the road. They're, They're putting their money where their mouth is, all those different phrases. People should be able to look at us and see Jesus Christ. I know we're never going to be perfect. I, never, I know that we're never going to get to that point where we are exactly like him. But we are to strive to grow and mature and to be more like him each and every day. And when people look at us, I really hope that they don't look at us and, and say, well, this person said that, says they know God. Apparently they go to church over, you know, such and such street, but you wouldn't know it by the way that they live. That's a really tough spot that we do not want to be in. We want to be people who are known by our actions uh, in a good way. Another example that I came across that I think is, is really good, we looked at this uh, a few weeks ago, several weeks ago, but uh, the Apostle John will mention some things along this same line of thinking as well. Uh, John's very big also in putting your money where your mouth is. He says, whoever says, I know him, speaking of God, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. So Paul says to Titus, these people claim to know God, but by their actions they're denying him. John takes it a little, little bit further, doesn't he? And he says, if you say that you know him, but you don't do what he commands, you're a liar. That's rough. It reminds me, remember when Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, he says, why do you, why do you say to me, Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you to do? See, it's good for us to know God. It's good for us to have that knowledge. It's good for us to maybe sometimes have those spiritual highs where we're ready to to knock down a wall and, and just do all kinds of things for the kingdom. But we have to follow it up with action. He'll also say in chapter 3, verse 18, John says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. And that's really what we've been talking about as we've gone through this. Taking, not only saying the right things and knowing the right things, but putting that together with actionable steps. That we're taking steps to put those things into practice. So what does this mean for us? Well, I think one of the things that we talked about, we need to move not just from this emotion. We need to take that emotion and figure out how do we channel that? How do we turn that? How do we transition then into some, doing something for God? How do we turn that into action. I think one of the, the biggest hangups with this, and I mentioned these spiritual highs that we sometimes have, I think the reason that we fail so miserably after things like that, we have this really, really big high, and then we have just almost equal fall and crash. I think it's because we've dreamed up these really big dreams because we're using that raw emotion that we're feeling, and we're just like, yeah, let's do this and let's do that. And you're not really stopping to ask yourself if that's something that you can actually carry out right now. And so it's just kind of one of those things where maybe, you know, your eyes are getting bigger than, than what you really, really can handle. And so I think sometimes we maybe need to be okay with stepping it down a little bit and saying, you know what? Here's some really big plans that I would like to carry out for God and for the church. I don't know that we can tackle that right now, and maybe we're just getting ahead of ourselves because we're really amped up. Maybe we need to step it back a little bit. Let's just start with something small. And I think that's really the, the, the best way to approach it is let's start with something small. If we're moving forward, if we're doing the right things, it doesn't have to be a grand gesture all the time. We're not going to, we're going to have very few of those moments in life, actually, where we have this huge grand gesture where we do something for God's church and it's just this big, amazing thing that maybe we've dreamed up or planned. No, a lot of times it's just going to be something very simple, something that we can do from day to day and then we can repeat it. And so we can do a, a lot of different things if we start small and think about, well, how can I do these things and how can I put them into practice and maybe some bite-sized ways that are a little bit more manageable. And then I can build on that momentum and, and start working towards doing better and bigger things for the kingdom. So maybe this is as simple as, hopefully you're not going to do it today because we have a potluck. But if you go out to a restaurant, hey, tip your waitress well. Smile at a stranger. 
Say hello to them. Maybe you volunteer to, to work at the food bank. Maybe you say, hey, I'm going to offer free babysitting to a single mom so that she can go, go to work and do what she needs to do. Uh, maybe I'm going to invite people into my home and have a meal with them. There's all kinds of things that we can do. You know what they are. You've done them before. We just get so caught up in these spiritual highs and think that we got to knock it out of the park every single time. And maybe we just need to worry about getting on base. Maybe we just need to do some things, small things, and just keep repeating them over and over and over again. Another thing that I think is good for us is to ask the question, can people see Jesus in the way that I live? That goes back to those passages that we looked at specifically in in Titus there. You know, you you say you know God, but can people see that you actually belong to him in the way that you live? Can people see Jesus in the way that I am living my life? I think you know the obvious application of that, because if you say that, well, I don't know that they can, well, then you know what you need to change. You know what you need to do. Despite how maybe you've seen some churches or other places operate, we understand, I hope you understand, God did not call us to be his people so that we could just sit on our rears. He wants us to go out and actually do something with all this stuff that we already know and all this stuff that we continue to grow in knowledge of. We have a lot of knowledge. We have a lot of spiritual highs. Don't leave that in the pews because there is a lost and dying world outside of these walls who desperately needs to know Jesus and you know him. But maybe your life isn't pointing out to others that you know him. And so maybe it's kind of prohibiting you from telling them that you know him and spreading that message. We need to be people of action. Conviction is useless unless it's converted into conduct. We offer an invitation anytime that we are together. Uh, We offer that invitation here this morning. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what's on your heart, what's on your mind. Maybe you brought something heavy in with you this morning. Uh, we'd like to pray for you. We'd like to give you a hug. We'd like to help you and support you and encourage you. Or maybe you're someone who says, you know what? I need to put my money where my mouth is. I know what the scriptures say. I know what Jesus has done. I know that I need to be baptized and I need to start walking with him and, and living this life of commitment to him. And we're ready to help you with that if that's your need as well. Whatever we can help you with. If there is a need at all, I'll be down front. Come down here and tell me about it. All together we stand and sing. Jesus and be always pure and good. Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see. T'was best for him to have his way with thee. Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have him save you so that you need never fall? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see t'was best for him to have his way with thee. Would you in his kingdom find a place of constant rest? Would you prove him true each providential test? Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His 
love can fill your soul and you will see twas best for him to have his way with thee. Thank you, Aaron. Our final song will be number 572. We'll sing the first and last verses of this song, and then Brother Kevin Keenan will dismiss us with a closing prayer. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We pray with you, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for this uh, Lord's Day that we've had to be able to join together. Pray that you would be with each and every one of us. Pray especially that you would be with those that are not able to be here today. We pray that you would be with each of us and remind us to reach out to them and encourage them. We especially pray for those that are sick and pray for those that are there, uh, taking care of them. We would also ask that you would be with the shut-ins, ones that are unable to get out, and help us to reach out to encourage them and inform them that they are still definitely a part of our family here at Southern Ridge. We are so blessed with our leadership. We're thankful for the preachers, for the elders, for the deacons, and all the work that is done there. We're blessed to have many teachers to help uh, encourage each and every one of us with their lessons. And most of all, we're so thankful and blessed for the encouragement that we have today to go out and to live our lives as an example and to uh, allow people to see Christ through each of us in the way that we live and the way that we react with others. We pray that you would be with us and help us to remember that Jesus gave his life on that cross to help with each of us and to give us hope of eternal life in heaven. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.